Hello everyone, today we talk about offensive weapons of the migration era or early medieval times, depending on how you want to periodize. Let's say that the standard that we put in here, without um, getting too much in further details, because there would be a lot to talk about, is let's say the 6th century Germanic freemen. Uh, um, <coughs> in a bit in old Latin Germanic Europe at this point, it could be either Scandinavia or or, 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 or Spain, I mean it doesn't matter really because um, at the time there was a degree of material homogeneity for socio-economical reasons that um, makes really all these areas comparable. It's really politics and society that made, mm, let's say, uh, really the difference uh, uh, this time in military terms, but let's say that the equipment uh, was pretty much similar all over Europe, with minor differences um, uh, that can maybe help us characterize a little bit a, a, a people maybe from another, but that sh shall, shall not be stressed because either we know them from, <coughs> from archaeological finds that are pretty scanny, uh, and that, by the way, show essentially, uh, as I was saying, a, a, a consistent material homogeneity, at least in Latin and Germanic Europe, um, but or, or, or because otherwise we know that, uh, we know certain informations from maybe a historian that said, as we will be seeing now, oh, th that weapon was used by the, that people, and um, <coughs> and then eventually we know from, from grave finds and all that it was uh, used everywhere, in the case I would, uh, I was, mm, the example I was making is mm, Procopius' uh, passage relatively to the Francisca, so the throwing axe as a sort of Frankish national uh, weapon that it wasn't seemingly at all something like that, or maybe it was because we shouldn't obviously um <coughs> um uh, refuse um, what Procopius is saying just as he didn't understand anything. It, it was possible definitely that the Franks made um, a more extensive use of, uh, of these drawing axes, we don't know, but um, we d we d uh, that's the point, we don't really know, so <laughs> um, we should have, have gone there and really see how things were, and, and, and uh, this is a bit complicated at least. So I could talk endlessly, I could talk actually uh, about how uh, actually the, the, the same late antique times, so a great um, material homogeneity in terms of weaponry, um, both, um, I mean, between the, the Germans and the Romans, uh, people think, uh, so yeah, the Germans had their own equipment. Actually not. Um, both the Germans and the Romans were using a uh, quite s uh, syncretical set of weaponry that either they de derived the one from each other or from the Celts. Take the Sparta, for instance, that nor the Romans initially nor the Germans used. Uh, if not by contact for for with uh, for the Kel with the Celts, um, and by the way, uh, the migration era was this great um <coughs> blending moment essentially in of cultures of peoples and all, um, and it was also a, a a moment of great flattening of society, uh, in the sense that the wars, the mm, pandemics, and all kind of um, made. Uh, the uh, late antique world shrinking uh, in, in, in terms of degree of social complexity into what some people call the Dark Ages, better said the Early Middle Ages, but that can be considered as dark in the sense that we, uh, that this contraction brought objectively to a um, a less amount of sources being uh, recorded, so uh, it's really darker to look in them. Um, and this was a moment in this sense of great um, homogenization, mm, even if you take uh, the Germanic peoples that eventually settled into the Romanized lands, I mean, they, they got absorbed by the local populations, but, uh, and, and in turn local populations got part of the um, um <coughs> um, cultural influence of the, domina of, of the new rulers, essentially. Uh, that were, however, mixed with local aristocracies anyway, so as you understand, it, it doesn't really make sense to make, to, to, to draw lines, to, to sharply um, divide um, groups, like, this isn't the migration era at all. 
um, there was also very low technological potential which doesn't mean that weapons that were used at the time weren't uh, effective at all it's just that there were less resources it was a really um, really a poor world uh, in many ways um, so this meant that also the degree of tactical differentiation was pretty uh, pretty low so generally speaking the, the weapons that we see were used indifferently um, on horseback as well on foot which was really done in all times in history but I don't know if you take the full feudal age in the 13th century you realize that there were certain weapons that were um, at least certain kinds uh, of a particular weapon that was maybe more adapted for a certain type of fighting like if you take the cavalry lance normally had certain characteristics the the infantry lance had others but this doesn't mean that they couldn't be used at the time it's just that in the 13th century the society was more differentiated and in turn um, there were tactical bodies that were incre increasingly specializing uh, and therefore creating those differences in, in, in the 6th century um, this didn't exist and even if you take um, the Byzantine uh, army of this time and you confrontate that with one of the uh, uh, Romano-Germanic kingdoms, uh, what you see is really that it wasn't a, gr a great difference. I mean, it doesn't really make much sense to differentiate a, a 6th century um, Byzantine Caballarios from a um <coughs> from a 6th century uh, Longobard Arimanos, for instance. They were all equipped in the same fashion, more or less were trained uh, at using the same weapons. Um, they came from dif relatively different worlds, but uh, what you could see in, in battlefield, aside from actual tactics, in, in terms of sheer equipment, is was practically very similar, and also tactics probably didn't differ extremely much. Yes, it is true the Byzantines had these tactical modules that you can read about during uh, in the Strategico, for instance, but let's say that the praxis of, of warfare is actually um, much more flattening. Mm, so uh, ideal differentiation differentiations in this sense really depend uh, really crash in front of the reality of warfare that I mean, <coughs> yes, you can have better trained troops uh, at a certain point, so you can carry out more complex tactics, but I don't know if the terrain insert is in a certain way, if you have certain logistical problems, if th all the problems that can happen into a campaign, I mean, these armies weren't that different. They all kind of settled down to certain standards. Mm -hmm. Um, there is this uh, Roman historiography at the time that kind of stressed this difference for ideological reasons and that is something that started in very early in times but in, in technical terms we know that it wasn't really so true mm -hmm. and by the way much of uh, this, is, this was also a moment into which the Byzantine Empire was growing um, more decentralized in the sense that certain, I don't know, if you take, for instance, the reconquest of Italy after Justinian and the arrival of the plague and eventually of the Longbirds in the peninsula, uh, brought the local Byzantines of Italy to, to, to first of all, to, be to be left on their own by Constantinople. Um, so to, to grow increasingly Italian, let's say, and uh, more similar in this sense to the Longbirds, for instance, in terms of military culture and all. So there, there are also a lot of, of, of great differences within the same Byzantine Empire, which wasn't a monolithic um, entity, as we tend to stress sometimes, di didactically speaking, to oppose the centralized, Bi the Byzantine centralized administration uh, and bureaucracy and professional army in front of the uh, Latin Germanic systems that were very different. Uh, really, once again, the practice of warfare was pretty um, pretty homogeneous in many ways. So without further ado, let's simply pass to the weaponry. So f let's start with the throwing axe. Mm -hmm. In Latin, the throwing axe can have many names. Uh, the securis, um, the uh, securis missilis, that is uh, literally, you know, the uh, securis is um, 
the 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 axe obviously missile is emphasized it's like saying the throwing axe because it means the missile axe literally um I, w I wanted to check if in english there is a more uh specific no it's it's always the axe well okay um another name was the francisca or francisca uh and then the bipennis and uh, the um, so the, cra the the obvious characteristics of a throwing axe is that, um, as many other weapons at the time, um, telling the truth, is that you could use uh, it um, in, in in double ways. <laughs> I would say in this sense, um, you could use it in in hand-to-hand -hand combat as a normal axe or hatchet, um, but uh, it could become a throwing weapon. Mm -hmm. And, and according to Procopius that we were mentioning before, the Franks um, at a given signal and um, from the very first um, clash during the battle, they all threw together uh, the, the, the Francisca into direction of the enemy. Um, so uh, this idea of the um, throwing the Francisca all at once was something uh, extremely important into into ancient medieval tactics because especially in this time in the migration era from from the infantry usually um, because the objective uh, you know the, the this axe was pretty heavy it could be arrived up to I don't know 1.2 kilos so it, it's not just about the risk of taking um, the, the side of the blade but really also having something heavy that arrives as a blunt um, projectile, let's say, that can cause harm, breaking shields if it's maybe on the edges or maybe if it's already damaged at all. But um, it's not much about the individual uh, impact that can be uh, achieved also by other weapons, um, other missile, uh, other projectiles. Um, but really important thing of these heavier, relatively heavier weapons wi with a particular balance um, and that goes also for javelins and all, is that uh, throwing them all at once, the, the objective was to break the first lines of the enemies. Um, not really breaking them so that the, the, the enemy army would mm, simply break and flee because of, of, um, of um, a throwing axe volley, but really messing up the first lines that are the ones that uh, are made up by the strongest guys, the ones that the, 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 the guys in the rear are uh, trained to follow, um, the ones that keep uh, the, the unity of the formation, really. So, uh, doing this before, um, this was done before charges, like uh, throwing this, uh, so maximizing the effect by, uh, of, of the, of the um, by throwing all these projectiles at once and therefore creating a, a, a mess um, all at once that could be eventually exploited by a, a charge and hoping that a charge could break the enemy that in that moment was pretty um, uh, pretty uh, busy at, I don't know, taking the Francisca off of their shields or maybe they were wounded or dead or in trampling each other and all. Uh, this is a bit idealistic as well because what we know is that um, this was done also with other weapons, also with javelins. Um, we will talk about the angon uh, in a while. Um, this is what also the Romans did with their pila anciently, uh, and eventually the plumbata uh, or plumbate or marzio barbulo or marzio barbuli. Um, that were these uh, throwing weapons were used before, usually before the charge, in this mass effect to. Uh, to really break the unity of uh, the first uh, enemy ranks, um, it is a bit ideal because um, um, it's 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 not that the enemy is gonna stand there without doing anything, just waiting for you to 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 break their ranks <laughs> with Franciscas. Uh, I it's more likely that they're gonna throw at you something back at the same time. Um, <coughs> so even though the tendency was definitely the one of throwing all these things at once. Um, probably the the big difference was made by the degree of uh, collective training also in here 
uh, the connection of these uh, volley, let's say, together with the following charge and keeping order in, into the charge, which is crucial for its uh, for the sake of its success. Um, possibly also the ground was definitely a, uh, if anything, for gravity that that can help you or or, or not. Um, but it, it could simply happen. I don't know that. Uh, um, one guy wanted to throw uh, 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 Francisca at the enemy, maybe even alone, like just doing this uh, individual, um, um, you know, act of uh, indiscipline, by the way, because, you know, if you waste, uh, in this sense, uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the axe, uh, um, before the, the major charge, you're, you're basically subtracting, you're, you're detracting um, uh, projectiles to to to, to the um, collected volley. So you will uh, increase the uh, chances of of failure in this sense. Because one thing in, uh, is throwing uh, uh, um, one axe in uh, every minute for 100 minutes. One un one thing is throwing. 100 axes in one minute, uh, and, 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 and the, 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 the greatest effect is going to be made by, by the second, especially from a psychological point of view in terms of, this of collective disorder and all. So you have always to reason in terms of collective formations. By the way, the, um, the, the throwing axe could be definitely used um, uh, on horseback as well. There is a beautiful passage from Paul Di Diacon relatively to the Longobard King Authory that uh, threw, um, um, you know, elevating himself over the horse uh, by, um, you know, really um, keeping safe with his tykes uh, on, on, on horseback and then launching, like as if he was standing on the horse, a, uh, an, uh, a throwing axe directly at one tree. Um, so the Germans really used these uh, axes as a, and, and there were uh, even he, here we have a king even. So the, you you understand how the German nobility even was perfectly trained with these weapons, and how it, it was even a matter of you know of, of showing off of prowess. We we definitely have to think that it was a lot of competition, that the lack of centralized um, uh, training. In, in these Romano-Germanic kingdoms from a sovereign centralized power uh, was compensating with this clanic um, unity. Uh, so this idea that you had to be uh, competitively one better than the other and therefore exercising uh, with these weapons on their own. So we have reproduced uh, Franciscas from the uh, from the archaeological finds, um, and we have um, created this this um, um, let's say I don't know the shaft can be like for forty centimeters, uh, the the length of the uh, of the metal part of the blade pro of the axe proper was uh, like eighteen uh, centimeters on average, so definitely they could vary. Um, there was no standardization at this time. Every warrior could build his own axe, uh, in, in, in theory. Um, <coughs> so uh, we have seen that with these dimensions in you can uh, achieve multiple rotations at um, every, you know, one rotation in the air every four meters with, with a tribal rotation even. Um, this, however, seems that uh, like um, a very theoretical concept in the sense that, first of all, um, you know, one thing is exercising for, for sports with ideal conditions, with the with a distance that is always the same, and um, and counting these uh, rotations according to the meters, but. Um, when you use these weapons uh, in, in real condition, real war uh, conditions, um, you can't have the certainty of distances. Uh, I mean, you have to eyeball that. So you you we have to think that this um, uh, during the migration year uh, era, the um, the collective training uh, was usually pretty low. There wasn't great discipline. Um, tactics were relatively simpler than in previous times, but definitely the individual skills were higher. 
uh, on average at least. So we have to think without too much surprise that these guys uh, definitely had uh, used to these weapons uh, so frequently and not just in warfare that they knew perfectly at every uh, situation how to achieve um, a good deg degree of mm, of precision and of lethality just by you know impressing more or less I don't know with with uh, force or, or even the way they they manipulated the axe while it was thrown um, and it's obvious that you can't get um, uh, clear uh, hits uh, every time um, so um, it was really about the individual capability of of, of achieving uh, a good uh, a good shot and um, and this as we've seen was also praised in literature it was something that we know was very important unfortunately um, d uh, after the christianization of uh, uh, of Europe the um, the, the Germanic uh, graves um, stop um, uh, being uh, filled with uh, with weapons, among other things. So I would say that by the uh, by the beginning of seventh century, basically, in the, at least in Merovingian graves, we can find much more. The same goes in in uh, in Italy by the uh, mid of seventh century. Probably uh, Alemannia, that is today's roughly Alsace in southwestern Germany, um, grave goods were placed in pagan fashion, even if the people had uh, the Alemanni had theoretically uh, Christianized, at least in their elites. So we have several, um, and obviously also in the non Christian Europe, we have a longer persistence of um, buried uh, weapons in, in, in within the graves. Uh, but w for Western Europe, let's say that it's, it's usually 7th century, uh, the, the last moment into which we can know, unfortunately, much about this kind of weaponry. Um, the um, however, I wanted just to, to make, a, to make some, saying something more precise relatively to the um usually the the part uh, the the axe uh in i mean the iron the iron part could weight could really vary pretty much in weight um that's all what gives the, the balance to the axe uh, when as we were saying it could be calibrated on the uh individual abilities of the warrior um so there wasn't a standard uh, Francisca or throwing axe. Uh, everybody kind of, and, and they were probably just like with, with other weapons, different sizes and different, um, even different characteristics depending on what you had to do. Um, by the way, there weren't also, uh, there were also axes that um, hadn't to be thrown, <laughs> by the way, so y that you would use just uh, as an axe. These were mostly blunt weapons, by the way, even if the uh, the axe has a blade and can cut, um, usually uh, the axe is, is good at, cr at causing traum traumas uh, under the um, uh, the, uh, the code of mail, so uh, this has also an important thing, and it could definitely, as we were saying, breaking through woods, like for shields and also uh, it was definitely a, a a dangerous weapon, and uh, and and it's surely extensively very very much used. It could be turned useful for other things like cutting uh, wood or <laughs> I don't know other works and all. Um, and very often at this time, you can't definitely say this is a military weapon and this is like a uh, just a peasant tool because certain weapons w were actually tools in this sense. Then let's talk about the lance. <laughs> in Latin, it could be called either lancia or asta. Um, the the uh, th there was also another term that is the framea that was a uh, it's more of a classical term that is basically the name that the Romans like Tacitus gave to the uh, Germanic spear uh, spears uh, of 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 uh, older times, um, which were also pretty long and used as throwing weapons as well. Um, let's say, however, these lances. I mean, also lances are something that can uh, differ really much in construction, in dimensions. Um, in all, 
um, certain um, um, most of these languages were actually conceived as javelins as well. Mm. Uh, there is not, scientifically speaking, a moment to which you can say, I mean, this is a, a lanx and not a javelin, because basically if it has a, it has a pointy end, it, it's just shaft, you can still throw it in some fashion. It can be more or less balanced, more or less conceived for throwing weapons or for being a stopping weapon. Um, but um, in, in in determined conditions it can be um, uh, used uh, in, in both ways. And it was definitely done o on average, really, um, as such. Um, the, uh, the Germans, by the way, um, from especially from their... Um, w which is something that usually uh, I connect to their uh, progressive romanization. Mm, people are like to to stress the um, the uh, the idea of the um, Germanization of the Romans, but actually the the Germans that uh, that took over into Western Europe at the time were pretty infl uh, pretty heavily Romanized, and they also often used uh, Roman weapons, they uh, and armor, they they knew Roman tactics. Uh, and as we were saying, there wasn't such a uh, as a, bi a, a big difference in practice uh, with what they used to do or or, or didn't. Um, and uh, the uh, probably one of the most evident um, uh, consequences of this romanization was the uh, as a weapon was the angon. Uh, in Latin, is called ango which was a variety of, of lengths uh, that was given um, um, a, a, um, in, in a, a, at the uh, upper end a um, an iron shaft, a very um, thin one uh, that could could be uh, could have a, actually a different geometrical section. It could be either be round or uh, polygonal or or squared. Um, and depending probably also by the use that uh, you want to do of that, because seemingly square section also in missiles, in, in other missiles take, especially crossbow bolts and all, um, uh, was used uh, mainly for um, damaging um, 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 armor, because the square section has this um, this characteristics. Uh, and uh, while well the circular one is more used uh, in uh, in hunting, if I'm not wrong, uh, and uh, even if against unarmored opponents, indeed, because there is not a great difference between uh, hunting weapons and, and and war weapons at this time. Um, and uh, the, um, the the length of the angon was could be uh, could really vary. It could be either 80 or 125 centimeters. Actually, think it could be also much longer because I've seen at least certain reproductions that suggested that it was possible. And the uh, the iron end, uh, the iron extremity, uh, so the low uh, the upper uh, end, terminated with a sort of a, of a point uh, like like the one of a of a um, of an arrow mm, with a certain um, uh, it could be either mm, hooks or, um, or or spores, um, and uh, the uh, the the you know the handling point the the handling uh, part was done in in uh, in in wood. And uh, let's see what Agatius actually uh, describes the in his Historia. Uh, it's Ag uh, Agatius uh, Historia uh, two uh, um, book two um, or chapter two. I don't remember five six. Um, here, here I have a translation from Greek, um, and it, uh, let's read together. Angons are spears that are neither very short nor very long, but suitable for throwing, should it be necessary, as well as for engagement at close quarters. The great part of it is covered um, all over with the iron, and the same with uh, with the ferule, so that the uh, so that very little of the shaft can be seen. 
At the tip round the head of the spear are curved barbs reaching downwards from the blade itself on, on both sides like curved hooks. Suppose a Frank throws his handgun in an engagement. If the spear strikes a man anywhere, the point will penetrate, and neither the wounded man nor anyone else can easily pull it out, because the barbs with, um, pier uh, which pierce the flesh hold it in and cause terrible pain, so that even if the enemy is not fatally hit, he still dies as a result. And if it sticks in the shield, it fixes, it, um, it fixes in it at once and is carried around with it, the butt dragging on the ground. The man who has been hit cannot pull out the spear because the barbs have gone in and he cannot cut it off because of the iron that covers the shaft. When the Frank sees this, he quickly treads on uh, it with his foot, stepping on the ferule. The ferule would be iron uh, finial on, uh, on the butt of a spear or, or, or other pole weapon, and forcing the shield downwards so that the man's hand is loosened and his head and breast bared. Then, taking him unprotected, he kills him either cleaving his head with an axe or piercing his throat with another spear. So you see here Agatius give us, um, gives us a pretty mm, mm, picturesque uh, um, image of what a... Um, uh, 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 but, uh, this is a, a kind of an in, uh, ideal individual fight, could be a pretty bloody one. The guy gets finished off uh, by uh, uh, an axe on the head or by a sp another spear and the angon is basically doing what the ancient Roman pilum did basically got stuck in the um, in the shield or in the guy's uh, body um, and it, 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 it's very difficult to be pulled out by the way these barbs um, you have to think at that time that most of the people really didn't die because of bleeding or, or internal trauma but because of the infection septicemi that that arrived because of the of the infection, uh, because of the uh, of the lack of antibiotics. I mean, and, and that was really uh, uh, even a, a a small cut could could grow to be fatal in certain cases. So the problem of not being able to stick out barbs because you felt this atrocious pain is definitely something horrible. But you understand that tactically speaking, is pretty effective. Um, and um, I find that this is very interesting because you realize that the way these weapons was uh, this weapon the, the angon was used was exactly the same one of the Roman pilum. I mean the Germans together w um, um, uh, had really learned to to achieve this um, to to create these weapons to 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 reach uh, a degree of collective training that allowed them to launch uh, uh, all uh, together uh, at once uh, this uh, heavy javelin, because the, the Angern, just like a pilum, is a heavy javelin. It has, by the way, the same degree of, uh, of penetration of, of a Roman pilum. So um, that's why I was talking about full romanization of the, of the Germans also under this point of view. And and since most of the Germanic um, armies was made up uh, were made up of, of infantry, and, and most of their uh, success was um, re relied on the uh, uh, very impetuous charges that they did uh, all at once to to to, um, to crush the enemy ranks because they couldn't really last very long on the, on, on the battlefield. They had a f um, poor logistical systems, so really concentrating all the efforts in, into uh, a great collective charge was the uh, and the most effective way to crush the enemies, in including the Roman armies, and throwing all these weapons at once was, before the charge, was r uh, going to maximize the effects. And the Romans really, uh, I mean, the Romans really, in the fourth centuries, uh, century with the Constantinian reforms, created a, a kind of an army that, in this sense, was able to, um, to contrast the enemy to contrast the Germanic charges, but, you know, the, the odds were pretty, um, uh, pretty even in this sense, so um, uh, the, the Rom uh, Roman infantries and, and uh, Roman and Germanic infantries were really pretty similar at, at this time. 
um, from this point of view. So you understand here how dynamic also these fights uh, were. Um, then uh, we have also another witness uh, uh, about the uh, usage of the um, the uh, um, uh, the the angon that is, however, a bit less credible. Um, that is from the poem of Valtteri, I believe, um, from the 10th century, um, that uh, basically um, transforms the angon in, in a sort of harpoon. Basically, the angon, uh, according to the poem, was um, uh, fixed to three um, to three uh, chords, essentially to three uh, wires, um, uh, each one of which was um, kept by one 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 warrior. Mm. It was held by one warrior. So, basically, the angon was thrown by by another a fourth warrior, uh, and if it got stuck on the shield of the enemy, basically, uh, the as we have seen from Agatha's the the barbs. Um, entered into the shield and the three warriors that were holding the uh, the the wires tied to the angon kind of pulled it uh, kind of pulled the wires and um, basically obliged the enemy to to let the shield go and to fight uh, at that point without protection um, now this seems pretty unusual and um, I personally think that this this wasn't really a um uh, a real practice at the time um however and i I've, I've i've been hearing it for so many times uh, uh um as a discarded options that uh, by by nature <laughs> i want to to at least exercise my mind in thinking what kind of situation this could have been uh, feasible because from a strictly technical point of view it's it's not something impossible i mean you can achieve that uh, and, and it is something also pretty clever if you think about it. But um, the uh, the idea is that on a battlefield, especially in enclosed ranks with uh, um, uh, into the w which the main problem is to keep really the front compact in advancing like uh, a single man. I mean, these um, four guys orchestrating all this just for taking uh, off the shield from from another guy it seems pretty uh, pretty strange i mean think about the space think about the numeric disproportion of of four guys uh, getting together just to do that um it, there is no logic in, in doing this you know in a in a real battle mm. uh, Sure, th there can be a situation in which maybe this can be done, even on a battlefield, in theory, but what I'm saying I th is that probably wasn't systematic. Um, it sounds something... Uh, it sounds uh, something like a brawl trick, <laughs> more than else. Um, however, I would like to remember one thing that is a bit different, really, uh, conceptually and also materially speaking, that I think from um, later medieval times, uh, I remember it was um, definitely done at the Battle of Bouvin, for instance, um, the idea of, of throwing harpoons at the enemy in order to basically capture him during the battle. This was done with Philip II, King of France, that at a certain point to the Battle of Bouvin was really pulled from one side or the other, from the French and the anglo uh, the Anglo. Um, uh, German side, <laughs> you know, the, the king, the poor king, harpooned and and pulled uh, really for for uh, for being catch, uh, captured, and with the French guys trying to guards to to to, to try to hold him uh, back. Um, so th that's kind of the only thing that resembles something like that. I mean, in in this sense, the the angon, according to the poem, the Valtteri poem is um is r really working as a sort of harpoon mm. it's specifically conceived for for uh, against a shield in this case but hey you know why can't be you know wh why in this sense maybe a single um uh um angon could have uh, couldn't have been uh 
couldn't be um, 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 you know mm, enough just to to remain stuck in the enemy shield and 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 uh, still causing to him a lot of um, a lot of discomfort of uh, uh, of um, uh, of uh, reducing his mobility having problems to to balance the shield and all um, so yeah this is all I can say really about it and it doesn't seem uh, a real a uh, really a real practice uh, a, a real widespread practice at least into the war for that time uh, um, Relatively to the Lanx, I wanted to say, however, that Lanx remained uh, basically the most important. Either it was thrown or used as ha in hand-to-hand -hand combat, it was definitely the uh, the most important weapon at the time, the most widespread, um, for many reasons. Actually, it's very cheap. Everyone can build a Lanx. Um, um, it's much cheaper than sword and tactically speaking uh, it is um, um, it is pretty um, 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 uh, pretty um, you know it, it, it's more it's more effective I mean it's not that you fight uh, if you let uh, two guys fighting one with a, with a with a lance and one with a, with a sword you know the guy with the lance is always winning but uh, statistically speaking, the guy with with the uh, uh, lanx definitely has an edge, and usually during the migration era, uh, we have to remember that that the uh, average fighter really um, uh, fought, um, you know, with, with all weapons. I mean, the lanx was the first one, the main one, uh, which was used in formation, but also on individual fight. And, and don't think that. Uh, in one versus one, the lanx is is worse than the, s the spear. There, there have been HEMA practitioners that have uh, demonstrated that it is not the case. Um, the spear is gonna win most of the times, um, but the same guy could carry a sword at the same time and a throwing axe and a scrum axe that we will be seeing in a while, um, and. And also think that the spear in in the Germanic world was actually a pretty uh, powerful symbol of the um, the um, uh, the fighters individual. Actually, the same term German in Germany comes from spear because uh, it comes from German, and Ger is uh, the spear. So it, it basically, originally the Germans it, as a tribal ethnonym uh, co conceived themselves as the German, hmm? so the, the man of the with the spear, and the same goes with Herr and Herr, that I believe that uh, that are um, th that means lord or man and uh, and uh, and uh, an army, that actually uh, derive from the same uh, from the same um, ethnonym pr practically. I mean, uh, it, at, at least I, I believe that etymologically speaking, they're uh, they're deriving one from the other. Um, so the um, the spear was really a prominent uh, weapon. You could use it uh, in, in every condition, in every situation. Uh, it could break. Uh, this is a good reason why usually eventually fighters pass to the swords, but usually first it was about the spears. Mm -hmm. uh, and definitely the spears also in this shield walls, in this compact, um, um, in these thick masses of of infantrymen was definitely something that you can use to into uh, warfare and um, I mean in a collective formation uh, with it will say uh, an additional effect in practice uh, that is definitely greater than the sum of the single the individual spearmen uh, as fighter as single fighters and this is the reason why <laughs> tactics exist and why the uh, messy melee that uh, with one versus one that you see on television uh, it's uh, a, uh, uh, it's a, a whole pile of uh, uh, of idiocies uh, because uh, real battles were never fought, fought in that way uh, if you want to know one thing about battles know that that uh, Hollywoodian um, individual um, chaotic mess never existed there was all e even in the most uh, disorder conditions always 
two blocks of people and when they collapsed the guys fled they weren't standing there to be chopped down individually uh, and if they wanted to exist they usually still did it into uh, little blocks uh, of, of, of little groups of, of people so um, getting to the sword instead uh, which is very important actually the sword um, was rising in preeminence um, into the late antique warfare which kind of sounds strange because you were you know uh, there was an imminent economical crisis during the late um, antique and early medieval time especially early medieval times so why all this emphasis that is begin beginning to be placed on the sword <laughs> well this is a bit complicated to explain because um, the um, uh, there is a lot about the uh, Indo-European culture and metallurgical history uh, of, of um, let's say history of metallurgical technology that should be uh, really told about this um, definitely uh, the, the early Germans used a very few um, iron metal weapons uh, and iron weapons especially eventually during migration era kind of inherited part of the Celtic metallurgic tradition um, then eventually with the the arrival of many peoples from the steppes especially of Iranian stocks like the Sarmatians that had a very advanced metallurgical uh, knowledge um, there was uh, you know all a culture that is also at the base of, of the Western chivalry that plays a lot of emphasis on the sword as a sort of an alter ego of the warrior all the legend of these armations that arrived in Britain and created in this sense the myth of uh, with their uh, um, uh, m with their uh, grave burials of with mounds and the sword placed on it to the myth of King Arthur and Excalibur and all these things that really are uh, ideologically I'd say uh, at the base of, of Western chivalry but in my opinion there is a more trivial um, element uh, in the sense that that really expresses the importance of the sword um, really for the Romans first of all the sword was very very important the uh, cingulum militaris that was essentially the belt around which the uh, on, uh, at which the sword was hanged was growing to especially during the late uh, Roman times growing as a sense of uh, as a symbol of s uh, uh, as a status symbol of distinction I mean the guy who carried the sword was not just like the uh, the average like in the old uh, days of the peasant soldier uh, of the citizen and soldier sorry um, but it was growing as something socially um, you know um, stratified in, in in theory the Germans were doing a bit the same thing um, uh, the Germans definitely even before the migration era were increasingly using um, swords from the previous times of Augustus into which they just usually had clubs and spears and all and the swords were something very rare um, but I think that from the migration era one of the main um, let's say sources of pride was really sacking I mean making loot uh, and especially of, of, pre of precious metals that were quite rare into Germany and into Eastern Europe from these from where these people uh, came so the idea of having a sword and uh, not having produced it yourself or having sort of paid it but having actually won it as as a, as loot um, was something that really uh, identified not just the uh, the average free Germanic freeman as such, but really the the victorious Germanic freeman. Um, and uh, if you look at the um, social balances of the Germanic peoples during the migration era, you realize that the uh, most uh, the strongest pe peoples were the ones who had a greater national cohesion who used uh, who usually had a, um, uh, let's say um, a um, um, let's say a, a, a stronger middle class let's say into which the aristocracies weren't really trying to disarm the the freemen for the for the sake of their own uh, power but who had a great um, 
commitment, let's say, among all the various clans uh, at conquering and sacking other uh, <laughs> other populations. So the best, um, the most successful Germanic peoples take the Longobards uh, when they they defeated the Japan and uh, the Japanese, for instance. The Japanese uh, were another Germanic tribe. Seemingly, they won because they had a, a, a much uh, more uh, well-off middle uh, class of freemen, while the Japanese ha had been uh, grown stratified with a bulk of relatively rich nobility and the rest of the freemen that were poorly armed because they were too poor. So the idea of being uh, uh, um, a freeman with a um, with a sword was definitely the idea of being part of a of a victorious people, of someone who could afford, even at, at the uh, at in the average fighter, a sword. And in fact, if you l if you look at Longobard graves uh, in Pannonia, so modern day Austria and Hungary, so before coming to Italy, uh, at the peak of their um, um, say um, military might, the Longobards had um, a um, uh, the, the you find in Longobard graves actually uh, a sword for every freeman. That is something fantastic because it tells you that uh, the, the percentage of, of, uh, of swords uh, available was extremely high uh, among the freemen, so high that they could allow themselves to bury uh, uh, the warrior together with the sword, so practically losing the sword. And this tells whole on the degree of militarization and uh, and of mm, and of military quality of the singular mm, peoples. So the uh, the these words at this time were usually the um, there were certain different types of swords. The the sword the, the swords of of the age of the migration era is definitely the spada, which it was a a sword that could re usually was um, between 75 and 90 uh, centimeters in length, and it was a kind of sword that was had been practically in use between the Romans and the Germans uh, since many centuries now, um, and that was really a s uh, of Celtic derivation. Um <coughs> uh, also, the gladius, the Roman gladius, uh, contrarily to what most people think of it that is like like a dagger was actually pretty long uh, on average it got shorter just during the the early um the early uh roman times and just in, in we don't know e even in effectively in which numbers the roman cavalry used this path actually pretty continuously all over this um the the early roman times the early imperial times um, the spada, in this sense, was a very good weapon for uh, to to use on horseback because of of the balance that is shifted towards the tip makes it as a, a very good striking weapon from the above, um, and this kind of weapon was really widespread all over Europe at this time. Um, and uh, the name in Latin it, it was double edged, <laughs> uh, symmetric, um, and I in Latin it could be. Um, found in sources named as Spada or as Ansys or Gladius indifferently because these were pretty um, generic names that they didn't belong to to the modern categorization the scientifical categories that as we intend them as moderns um, actually the blade was pretty thin um, and it was usually six centimeters large uh, but if you if you uh, if you look at it, you can't see it even here in the, in the background. It were was a pretty solid piece of, of of blade that could really do a pretty heavy uh, damage uh, damage in practice. Uh, it was relatively rare uh, before we mentioned the case of the longbirds, but um, elsewhere in Europe, it, it wasn't extremely uh, it wasn't extremely d um, widespread weapon, uh, especially. In uh, outside of the um, let's say when when the Germanic peoples eventually settled and uh, were absorbed by the local sedentary populations, obviously uh, uh, which weren't extremely well off at this time, 
you know, it becomes rare to find a spata concentrated in, into a specific group, like it could be a, uh, a people on the march during the migration era. There was mostly warlike um, people. Um, <coughs> so the, um, it was relatively light. Uh, there is a, uh, an elogium that Cassiodorus wrote uh, for the Ostrogothic swords in the 6th century. Um, and uh, the um, and 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 in this sense, this if you read that, you understand how much the spada was becoming a symbol of the same German um, military uh, prowess. I mean, I, the, even um, you know the the Germ the pro-German propaganda was essentially saying that uh, the Germans were the best fighters in the world that they had this extreme even technical capabilities of creating war and telling the truth the um, the metallurgical technology that the germans had acquired during the migration era was indeed pretty high uh, it could really depend on but really roman met metallurgy um, compared to the one of the steps and, and and that was inherited by the germans largely that also had the celtic tradition the noric uh, noric tradition I mean, it, it's very difficult to say who was more advanced at the time, and also consider that, you know, obviously having the, the best blades m does make a difference in practice, but uh, it can it, 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 it's not necessarily decisive at all. So it, it's all it's all about uh, it's all a matter of tactics, not really of the metallurgical technology that you have, but that can definitely help. And at this time, the Germans also tributed uh, magic um, powers to the swords, especially those who were um, uh, forged with the most um, sophisticated um, 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 techniques, and that were uh, the techniques that were accompanied, by the way, by the recitation of certain psalms, of certain songs that were thought to to impress a particular uh, power supernatural power to the sword so hence all this um, you know uh, you know ideal um, attraction towards the, the magic sword that exists into the middle ages because definitely these swords were what the Germ what what the warrior uh, entrusted his life into practically and as we as we said before the, the sword symbolized practically the, the same um, the same warrior. Think still about uh, the time of um, um, the of the Carolingians and the Battle of the Chanson de Roland, to which the um, the the Frankish paladin prefers to 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 crush his a uh, sword instead than letting it fall into the hands of the enemy while he is dying. So all this very romantic. Um, ideal that however has a uh, very deep r uh, and ancient historical roots and um, uh, if you look one of my videos that is uh, at the origins um, of many uh, um, of European uh, I, I don't remember the title of European chivalry or something like that um, I talk a, a little bit about this technological um, and also uh, religious um, side of of the sword in 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 symbol um, in symbolistic terms uh, during the time of the of the migration era and how that eventually affected um, uh, chivalry and the full Middle Ages and feudal uh, military um, culture um, so there were also other f uh, other types of swords. Actually, the, the the Roman dagger survived, and I'm pretty sure that also into the German world there was something similar to that. It, it, it existed essentially the short, the so-called short sword or semi spata, which means the mi sword in practice uh, referred to the to the dimensions that were in fact usually a half of the one of the spata. Um, the but the the other most prominent sword that, however, it can be classified even as a sort of a long knife in certain cases, or or as even a, as a small knife because dimensions could really vary extremely. 
um, is uh, is the sax or sax or scrum sax pair. Um, the um, that is also a very prominent weapon into uh, archaeological finds. It's also a very famous weapon in general. Um, you can. Uh, find it in in written sources named also as scramus or mucro or cultellus. So here you understand also the. It wasn't clear how really to to describe it because the cultellus, for instance, is a, is typically a knife uh, of some kind. The scramus axe, in fact, could be could reach uh, could have a length comprised between a, a, mm, let's say a few centimeters, like six, ten up to 85. Uh, also in here, the, the longest, I believe, the longest scrum sacks uh, that we have are of longbird origin. Mm. There are certain longbird scrum sacks that are particularly long. Um, people have argued that the longer this weapon was, the better it was suited for um, for horse uh, combat, which is definitely true because the scrum sacks, by the way, is um, is essentially a curved wep weapon, or slightly curved with a single edge in practice. Um, and such weapons, uh, since um, you know, uh, all uh, you know, in, in, in any time, are uh, together with sabers. Or think about the uh, the copies at the time of Xenophon, are essentially um, uh, extremely um, well suited for um, horse. Um, for cavalry warfare, and um, the reason is very complex. It all lays into the physics of the sword, and we don't have time to discuss it now. But um, um, it can be extremely effective mm, as a saber in practice. And 85 centimeters is pretty long. It's even longer than uh, than, than some spate. So um, this really tells you that it could be interchangeable in 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 some measure. Here in the picture, you see. A relatively, um, I think, average example of the sax. The you, you see here, it's um, it's relatively um, um, it's uh, it's relatively short, not that uh, thinner. On the contrary, here maybe it's the erosion, but it seems that uh, it's pretty. It's even uh, the blade is larger even than the the one of the spada. But uh, just for saying that, and and this the scramasax was definitely um, useful into combat. Um, you know, ev in every time in history, that there was a guy that, uh, together with the sword, carried uh, an, a smaller knife or dagger for closer combat. Um, it, it was also a, a pretty uh, useful tool, by the way. Uh, you have to think in the migration era, especially in the steppes or. Uh, in the uh, mm, uh, home, you know, pretty hostile um, uh, German uh, Central European environment, uh, you could use a scramasax for a, a whole load of things, like for scorching animals, for um, for creating other tools with, uh, with uh, by cutting to wood. I mean, and also for fighting, indeed, for hunting, um, and lots of other uh, other reasons, um, and. Um, the uh, and then there is also another um, typology of weapon that we don't find extremely prominent into into the migration era uh, warfare at least up to a certain point. Um, that is the uh, the bow that definitely ex uh, is 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 very uh, widespread, especially in Western Europe, but that you can find. Uh, all over the continent in practice, but it is usually related to a sort of poor um, usage. I mean, the, the Western bow during the migration era is usually something peasants w went hunting with. It has nothing to do with a composite bow that was the pride and even a sort of national weapon of the uh, horse riding peoples of the steppes. But um, in this sense, during the migration era, uh, quite large uh, elements of uh, Eastern populations uh, blended together with the Germanic confederations. And, and what you see definitely is that among the, um, uh, the Germanic armies of the time, the lower strata of the 
the population that could made up either of free men but also and especially by um, semi f demi free men and even by serfs or slaves as, as you want to call them uh, was ordered to be equipped with uh, arrow uh, bow and arrow uh, um, so this uh, practically um, shows that actually uh, r um, we know this through through archaeological finds that um, the bow was pretty uh, widespread yeah. also en masse among the, um, the migrating uh, the Germanic m peoples uh, um, on the march let's say um, and this is pretty understandable because for instance for fighting the the eastern populations like the Hans or uh, the Sarmatians definitely the Germans learned how to to counter them with arrow fire that is pretty effective especially against the hor the, the horses um, and it, it's definitely a weapon that did exist even the sling was used even if we don't know excessively much about slings it seems that from ancient times the slings progressively uh, um, disappeared or at least that people um, that the, the uh, subjugated populations at a certain point during the Middle Ages were kind of, especially during feudalism, um, were deprived of these armaments, or at least that they were forbidden. Actually, this link uh, is found in all mm, periods of the Middle Ages, including the Migration Era, uh, and we have no reason to, to think that it disappeared in some fashion. Um, but it was obvious that when the political and social elite was the one that wore uh, armor and the sling is a very effective weapon against armor, well, probably the elite tend to disarm the, uh, um, the peasantry, the shepherds, that were those who usually made, historically speaking, especially the shepherds, made a greater use of these weapons and it's a kind of um, nobody really knows why and neither if this is true this is kind of the general interpretation at uh, um, at 1.0 level let's say but uh, definitely this link was still used and probably widespread for, for what we can know uh, at this time it just seems that during the Middle Ages it progressively grew to mm, either to if not to disappear, which is impossible to do in practical terms, but at least to be to to become increasingly rare. Um, so this is uh, this is it. Uh, it was a kind of a roller coaster because for each of these of uh, these weapons we should talk endlessly. But let's take this video as an introduction, and I hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, and if you did, please uh, share this video. Otherwise. Uh, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you want to receive further news about my contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye!